Uh, welcome everyone to Data Platform Virtual Summit 2020. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, design patterns for machine learning projects. So you can consider design patterns as a part of uh, machine learning best practices itself. So before we get into the topic, I would like to introduce about myself. I'm Anupama Natarajan. So I'm from Wellington, New Zealand. I'm a data and AI consultant with 20 plus years of experience working in the IT industry. So I've been working as a uh, web developer and then moved on into the data space. I've been architecting a lot of uh, data warehouses and uh, uh, transactional based applications. And since then I moved on with uh, artificial intelligence. So I'm currently a Microsoft MVP for AI and I really passionate about data and the ways of exposing the data and deriving value out of the data for my customers. I'm also a Microsoft certified trainer and a speaker, and I organize the SQL Saturday in Wellington, New Zealand. If you have to reach out to me after this event, feel free to contact me through my social channels as shown on this slide. So without any further delay, let us quickly look at the agenda for today's session. So we are going to start with an understanding of what machine learning is. So even though like I, when I drafted this abstract, like I was thinking more about, I should be talking an advanced topic or intermediate to advanced topic, but because known about the audience, it will be always good to start with the basics around machine learning and how do you choose the right machine learning algorithm? And then we will jump on to like what design patterns are and where does design patterns fit in with the machine learning? And finally, I will wrap up the session by taking up a few questions from people. So what is machine learning? So there has always been this confusion saying like, what is the difference between artificial intelligence versus machine learning versus deep learning? So if you think about a machine learning as such, it is actually a subset of artificial intelligence. So you bear what it'll, it will be doing is, it is a data science technique, which will allow computers to use existing data and it can forecast any future behaviors or outcomes based on that. So you can think about machine learning as the ability to learn from data and to create models. So machine learning will be using data as well as some algorithms, which we will be discussing subsequently. And they are able to create models which will be able to solve complex data problems by finding patterns in them. So you may be thinking like, why do we really need machine learning when people can just look at the data and do that? Yes, of course, like if you have a spreadsheet with uh, just a thousand rows, well and good. But with the way how the data is growing these days, like we are talking here about terabytes of data. And if you want to just do that manually, it's not going to happen. And that's where uh, machine learning comes into picture. So some of the examples around uh, where machine learning can be really used in organizations is like around price predictions. You can think of uh, companies like uh, who can buy as well as sell services based on the demand. How do they identify like uh, what is the demand? And that's where like a uh, machine learning comes into play. So machine learning will tell these organizations around uh, how can they forecast the demand and also can make decisions around whether they want, it is the right time for them to buy the services or sell the services. So some other examples is like recommendations that you get. So when I wanted to start machine learning, pretty much like I started in the way of, I normally buy books from Amazon, right? Like I go and look for online books. And whenever I purchase a book, I always get recommendations saying, have you considered about buying these books? So some of the book authors or the titles I wouldn't have even noticed unless uh, until Amazon recommended it for me. So those type of recommendations also is because of machine learning. And the first time when I went to Amazon, it didn't know anything about me, like what I really liked about browsing in Amazon. But then once I started buying books there frequently, it knew like, okay, that's what I'm really interested in. And that's the reason I'm coming to Amazon. Automatically, when I log in, I get recommendations about the different topics I used to look for. So this is where machine learning can really add value. So recommendations with books is one example, but you can take that much higher in terms of like, okay, watching uh, movies or listening to different music in Spotify. So how does Spotify knows like uh, what is your 
what you like to hear and of course streaming the right music for you all those things is because of a lot of mission learning is happening in those organizations behind the scenes if i want to give you a, one more uh, business scenario where mission learning can be handy is um, a corporate scenario is your email filtering so organizations get a whole heap of uh, emails coming and hitting in them and uh, predominantly like you can also notice a lot of spam emails comes in those uh, set of emails how do you segregate the spams across the normal emails that needs to be sent to your employees again machine learning algorithms can be used in terms of categorizing spam emails apart from the normal emails that your organizations receive so these are some examples where machine learning can be really helpful and it is also adding a lot of value for organizations so coming back to that discussion around where does uh, machine learning fit in artificial intelligence so if i take uh, deep learning deep learning is nothing but a subset of machine learning machine learning is nothing but a subset of uh, artificial intelligence the artificial intelligence is like an umbrella term that comprises of all these other technologies within it so how do we choose the right machine learning algorithm so this is an important step before even we start thinking about design patterns so choosing the right algorithm for is a really important aspect when it comes to machine learning the reason for that is like uh, uh, you need to understand what is the problem you are trying to solve first of all so this is uh, an important aspect so someone from your organization may come to you and say like okay i want to forecast the prices uh, like what would be the power prices going to be in summer versus winter so if this is uh, the problem statement that they have given it has to be really clear and you need to understand whether uh, you can use machine learning to solve that problem first of all i have seen a lot of organizations jump on to this uh, big uh, thing around machine learning without really knowing like what is the problem they are trying to solve using machine learning so always ask that question saying what is the problem statement here that we are trying to solve and then check whether machine learning is the right way of solving the problem just because you have a problem statement it doesn't mean machine learning is the right way so coming back how do you determine like machine learning is the right way uh, input data is a important aspect in machine learning if you have wealth of uh, data sitting in your organization whether it can be labeled data or unlabeled data doesn't matter i'll just outline what it really means uh, still uh, if you have wealth of data then basically we can use uh, uh, algorithms to find patterns or behaviors within the data in order to predict things but if you have no input data uh, still you can do machine learning because some uh, situations like you may not have the data but you can train the model based on a different way of machine learning so let us start with the input data where you have got labels associated with that so in that case we call that as a supervised machine learning so what is supervised machine learning is you have data sets and you have also labeled those data sets appropriately and within supervised machine learning there are multiple ways or multiple algorithms that you can use one is classification the other one is regression so classification and regression or the algorithms pretty much used on labeled data so if you want to go down that path you can have a single way classification or a two way classification algorithms and the idea behind this is i'm not going to go down deep dive into machine learning algorithms here but just understand with supervised machine learning you have two types of algorithms there similarly when it comes to your input data where the input data is not labeled then probably you go down the path of unsupervised machine learning so where like there is no clear way of identifying okay so a classic example with supervised machine learning is you can say okay this is a fruit and this is an apple so if you label that the machine can easily segregate and learn from that data but unsupervised is like a way you haven't labeled anything which means it has to find the patterns and it has to group the things around Uh, those patterns or group the data around those patterns and that's what we call it as clustering or association because it has to create some sort of buckets to say like okay i can find some common patterns in this data let me start storing them into a cluster or uh, i will associate this data based on some relationships so where the data is not labeled then you will be going down the path of unsupervised machine learning 
situations where you don't have any input data, but you know that problem statement needs to be dealt with the machine learning, you can go down the path of reinforcement learning. So what is re reinforcement learning is like, a, you don't provide any labels or any data in here, the data will be fed through in real time. So when I say no input data, I don't have any historical data that I can provide to my machine learning model for training purposes. So I'm not saying like I'm just going to do machine learning without any data at all. This is talking about historical data is not available for training purposes. In that case, when the new data is coming through, it will automatically will make decisions around, okay, so I'm getting the right outcome here. So I will give you a, a positive point for this. And then if things are not incorrect, then probably it is going to give you a negative point. So it takes the data, predicts an outcome, the outcome is correct, then it gets a positive point. If the outcome is incorrect, it is going to get a negative point. And then by keep on feeding this data, and if you if it gets a negative point, what it will do is it will retrain the model, and then it will again give you an outcome. Again, you have to go through that process of whether the outcome is positive or negative. So that's what reinforcement learning is. So it is going to learn with this type of behavior. So if I want to uh, explain this in a nutshell, like if you have a cat, so normally uh, a cat or a dog, like you can tell them like some of the behaviors, right? You are doing this uh, right. Okay, I'm going to give you uh, some cookies. And if you're if they're not doing what you're asking them to do, then you won't be giving the cookies. So it will automatically learn saying, oh, okay, I have done something wrong here. So I let me go and redo the things again. And that's what reinforcement learning is. So based on whether you are giving the positive outcome or a negative outcome, the mission itself will go and retry and will provide an outcome again. So that's pretty much like you have the types of machine learning algorithms like supervised, unsupervised and reinforcement learning. And behind these things like you have got different set of algorithms like classification, regression, clustering and association are there. And of course, deep learning is a separate um, term of its own and it will go much more uh, delving into detail, looking for much more patterns in your data. So before we jump on to machine learning design patterns, what are really design patterns? I think if people are coming from a development background, you would have uh, heard about design patterns in your software development uh, life cycle. So define, design patterns are nothing but solutions to common problems. So if you think about some of the problems, it is going to be consistent irrespective of whichever machine learning model that you're going to create. So how can you come up with a common uh, solutions for solutions for common problems, especially in the machine learning world also? So if I take software development, I would say like, okay, I know I have to connect to a database and I have to use a pattern, design pattern for that because today the database can be a SQL server and tomorrow it can be Oracle and so on. But similarly in machine learning space, same thing, whatever model I'm going to create, uh, the data preparation, the model building, the optimization and operationalization of my models are all going to be consistent. So these are common problems irrespective of whichever model that you are going to create. And that's where like uh, design patterns come into play even in machine learning. So what are the common uh, design patterns that are available in machine learning? So these are some of the groupings of the design patterns that we will be looking in this session. So we are going to look at design patterns like uh, data exploration, uh, data reduction, data wrangling patterns. What are the patterns that come under supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning? How do you uh, have different design patterns to evaluate your machine learning models as well as to optimize your machine learning models? So in order to do that, what I have done is I have grouped these type of patterns around uh, the different machine learning models under data preparation, as well as the other criteria, like when you are going to create models, what are the design patterns you have to consider? When you have to operationalize your models, what are the design patterns to consider? So let us start with data preparation because this is the first and foremost process that you do when it comes to machine learning. So get the data and you have to prepare the data. And there is a lot of considerations you have to do when you are doing data preparation, especially in the context of machine learning. 
So before we solve any machine learning problem, a preliminary understanding of your input data is really important. And that's what I think the data exploration patterns will pretty much let you know. So let us look at some of these patterns that we will be delving through as part of looking at your input data. To start with, we will be looking at the central tendency computation pattern. So what does this pattern really mean? So what you are going to look at as part of this pattern is how can the makeup of a data set be determined in terms of a normal set of values? So in plain English, if I want to explain this is, so normally when you look at the data, uh, most cases like you will be looking for what is the mean or a median or an mode of the value of the data. So this is, we call it as averages in data sets. So for example, like if you want to calculate the household income, where most of the values, if you look at, it will be in the center of your distribution. But sometimes there may be some values which will be on the higher side of the income, or sometimes like will be on the lower side of the income. Uh, during these situations, like if you apply a pattern like median, sometimes you may not uh, get a right result, like a mean or median may not give you the right result. In that case, you have to use the mode option. So the mode is again a pattern that you can use in order to find this um, value of your annual income where the outliers and things can be easily identified. And this is the type of pattern you should be using when you're looking at the data to start with. So this is what we call it as a central tendency computation pattern. So the next pattern you should be looking in your data is around the variability computation. So what it really means is like how the spread of values in a single variable in your data set can be easily determined. And that's what you will be looking with the variability computation. So what it really means. So you need to understand like uh, what is the distribution of the values within this particular variable. So this is important to understand because when you want to do exploratory analysis uh, with your model, this is really important to understand. So then you will start grouping uh, this uh, particular values into something called as ranges. And then you will start saying, okay, this is my lower quartile and the medium quartile and the upper quartile. So again, what you do is if anything in any of your data sets outcomes doesn't match to any of these quartiles, then you will mark them as abnormal data. So variability computation pattern, pretty much you use that in terms of determining abnormality in your data sets using uh, the classifications in terms of like, okay, this is going to be the range one, range two, range three, or my lower quartile, median quartile, or your upper quartile. Then comes your associ associativity pattern or the comp associativity computation pattern. So as the name itself defines, it all about establishing or identifying relationships within your variables. So when you look at the data, the previous two things like the central tendency computation pattern or variability computation pattern, we talked about one variable and looking at the values within that variable. When it comes to associativity computation pattern, what you're looking for is the relationships between the variables in your data sets. How can I establish that relationships? How the relationship of one particular variable is going to impact the other. A classic example, if you think about is like, uh, sometimes if you want to sell ice creams, right? So you will be selling uh, the ice creams at the, throughout the year. So no reason saying like, okay, I have to sell it during summer or during winter. But what you start noticing the pattern is during summer time, your sales will be more and during winter time, the sale will be less. And of course, you know the reasons why I'm not going to explain that. But what here you can determine is using this data set, there is a relationship. So the outcome in terms of number of ice creams that are sold is based on the temperature here. So the temperature plays an important role here. So when you have to uh, a variable which is going to influence your outcome, that's uh, that's what we call it as associativity computation pattern. So in this pattern, you are going to go and figure out what are all the variables in my data set is going to influence my outcome. Then you will be like uh, grouping them together as an identifying data set. The last pattern under this category is your graphical summary computation. So 
what uh, this can help you is uh, not all the data sets that you're looking for can be always presented in a tabular fashion to provide you an outcome so not in the type of saying okay it is finding an average is going to solve the problem or uh, doing a, a mean or median is going to give me the outcome sometimes like uh, you have to look data in a visualization format also so that is where um, the graphical summary computation pattern comes into play so we looked at the data exploration patterns so what we'll be next looking at the is the data reduction patterns so again data reduction patterns it is to do with the preparation of your data sets so in data reduction patterns there are two different patterns we'll be looking at one is your feature selection and the other one is your feature extraction so what does feature selection really mean is how can you really figure out what set of features can be extracted from the data set for your model development? So what it really means is sometimes you may not, you may have a data set with hundreds of columns in there. So you may not require all those columns in order to determine the outcome. So you need to pick and choose what is the real features that is going to influence your uh, outcome. So then pick those columns only and keep them within your data set. It is similar to uh, the way we looked at the associativity computation pattern, where we are looking at the relationships. Similarly, same thing here. So features are finding out what are the variables that are going to influence your outcome and then holding them alone in your data and removing the, all the other columns. So that's why it's called as data reduction pattern. So the approaches that you normally take for feature selection, you can either use techniques like forward selection, which means uh, I will remove everything and then I will start adding one by one to determine what is going to influence my outcome. That's one way of looking at it or backward elimination, which is you can co hold on to all the columns and start removing it one by one. So one is start adding it one by one. The other one is the backward elimination is start removing it one by one so that you will get into a redu reduced data set. Or the third option is you can use some sort of decision trees. So you can decide on, okay, if I use these two columns, this is what the influence is going to be. So you can map some decision trees to decide on which particular columns you want to include in your data set. So that's what we call it as feature selection. Pick up only the right columns that you require in order for your model creation. The next one is your feature extraction. So how can the number of features in the data set be reduced so that your predictive potential of your features is part with your filtered features. What does it really mean in plain English? So it is all about finding the correlation between these features. So sometimes like uh, we are talking about uh, uh, outcome, when we talked about feature selection and associativity, we talked about like, okay, there is a relationship that is going to determine the outcome. But sometimes like you need to look at feature extraction based on uh, the correlation between these two features. So these two features are influencing the outcome, that's right. But these two features which are influencing the outcome, they are going to influence in the same fashion. So what it really means, you don't need both the columns to influence the same outcome, right? So if both the columns are going to give you the same amount of outcome, then probably it makes sense to what's what find finding the correlation between your features sorry finding the correlation between your features and using it appropriately so when it comes to data reduction patterns like these are the two design patterns that will help you to pick up the right data that you need for your machine learning models the next set of patterns that we are going to look is around the data wrangling so the data from a data wrangling perspective, like there are five different patterns or four different patterns that is going to help you. So the first one is your feature imputation. So what it really means is how can a data set with the missing features can be used in my model development without the need of deleting the entire rows or columns of valuable data. So this is around when I say wrangling, it's all about cleanup cleaning up your data, right? So what are the common patterns that you will be looking in terms of cleaning up your data? So I may have a data set. If I pick a particular column, which I know like it is a column that is going to influence my outcome. And when I look at the values in those columns, if I see missing values, I don't need to delete the rows of missing values because sometimes 
uh, that may pretty much you will reduce the volume of the data that you have to deal with. So in that scenario, what you normally do is you work with your data scientists and you can uh, provide some values for the missing uh, uh, information. So some reasonable values that you can provide for the missing information so that you can still use that uh, data set in your modeling. The next one is your feature encoding. So what do you do feature encoding? So mainly uh, how can the different categorical features can be used for your model development? And that's what you will be using in here. So this can be either your numerical features or it can be your um, categorical features that will be used in helping your machine learning algorithm. So if you think about feature encoding, it is all looking at uh, rather than just using numerical features that influencing the model, how do I use categorical features to uh, influence my model during my model development? The next one is your feature discretion. So this is an interesting one because uh, normally what happens is like uh, your machine learning algorithm normally supports uh, discrete or nominal features and uh, some machine learning algorithms by default they take these type of features only but you may need to have continuous features that needs to be fed through your machine learning algorithm so this particular pattern which is around uh, feature discretion will allow you to limit the number of discrete set of values from your continuous features that you are looking from your data to be fed through your machine learning model. It may sound complex, but when you are looking at it, like uh, uh, when you're looking at different algorithms, uh, they will be asking for, when you ask uh, to feed the data set, it will be asking for like, okay, can you provide the discrete features versus nominal, uh, your continuous features? You will try to understand what I mean during that time. Then comes your feature standardization. So, how can you ensure that the features with wide range of values doesn't overshadow your other features that has small range of values? Important thing to understand, right? So you need to make sure like uh, there is a standard approach of uh, how a feature influences an outcome. So you don't want to have one particular feature dominating just because uh, it has got a wide range of values over some features which has got a smaller range of values. So this also needs to be taken into consideration when you are doing data cleansing or how do you adjust it. But whenever you are um, making up or adjusting the data from a governance perspective, especially with machine learning, you need to make sure like uh, you are recording all these things saying as part of data preparation, what alterations that you are making with using all these patterns. So we looked at data exploration patterns, data reduction patterns, data wrangling patterns. Next comes your actual data modeling patterns. So this is where we start doing our modeling process itself. So when I say modeling, so we talk about supervised machine learning patterns and unsupervised machine learning patterns. What is supervised machine learning? We discussed about that in terms of like you have data sets with the labels and that you will be using in order to detect with the supervised machine learning patterns. It has got two um, design patterns. One is numerical prediction, uh, prediction and the other one is your category prediction. So numerical prediction is uh, how can the value of a numerical variable be predicted based on the known set of variables. So here you are going to, uh, the outcome is going to be a zero or a one. So that's what you are actually predicting here. So is this person going to apply for a loan or not? Or is this person, um, is it going to rain today? Yes or no, that's it. But when it comes to category prediction, that goes to the next level. So how can the category, um, whenever you fed in any new data, it will be predicted to see like which category it normally goes into. So this is what we call it uh, like, uh, um, your K mean algorithms and things that the classification algorithms that you are using. So you can say like, okay, it is a two way classification rather uh, or a multi class classification rather than saying as a single yes or no question. Okay. With the unsupervised uh, machine learning patterns, what are the different design patterns that you normally notice? 
with unsupervised machine learning so you have got your category discovery pattern so as i said like uh, identifying patterns in the data and then how do you group them accordingly so a classic uh, uh, thing that you use for this is your clustering algorithms so normally clustering algorithm is used to automatically group similar points of data into its own categories so when you uh, do this in terms of category discovery, you can automatically group these buckets of values into those categories and you can appropriately handle them. So one thing I mentioned about unsupervised machine learning is that here you are not labeling the data, right? So which means the patterns will be identified and it will be automatically grouped for you as part of this particular machine learning. So then you will have subset of patterns scattered across to say like I can find a age group here, I can find an age group of this, and there is a bit of behavior I can notice in these age groups. So you create a separate category for different age groups, and then you will start uh, uh, categorizing the data in that fashion. So that is your category discovery. So the next one is your pattern discovery. So this is quite interesting. So it's saying like, okay, what is the difference between category and pattern here? So how can uh, you use repeated sequences that you can find in large data sets? So pattern frequency is like, okay, ha has this data been used or appeared in this data set and how many number of times it has been appearing in a repetitive fashion? And that's what you will be uh, finding out as part of pattern discovery. So this type of uh, pattern discovery will be really important because you can find out some abnormal scenarios in your patterns, especially if a same thing is happening multiple times, then you can see the behavior is being influenced because of the repetitiveness of that pattern. So that's what you will be finding as part of pattern discovery pattern. So what it is um, doing is like, okay, there is a common theme here. So every time when this person comes at like a classic example is a supermarket, right? So if you notice a pattern saying, okay, this customer comes at this time and there is a pattern of always buying this product. So if you notice this across the board, then you can start influencing that customer with a, a similar set of uh, products when they come with during that time. And a classic example I will take personally myself is if someone is using my behavior or my pattern, around my data sets, I normally go and buy a coffee every day, right? And it is always going to be a consistent set of coffee. I don't mind getting a muffin, but there is a pattern or a particular muffin I will be really interested. If a cafe is using a machine learning algorithm or if they look at my customer data, of course I scan my card, which means they have my information readily available for them. They will be able to discover this pattern around this person always comes eight o'clock in the morning, try to get a coffee and Always there is a pattern in here saying like, if I have this type of muffin on that day, then the person buys that muffin also. So this is what a pattern discovery mean. So what it clearly provides is, okay, if there is a, quite a few on this uh, particular, because that muffin, which I'm interested in, they don't put on, on a daily basis. So if they notice like there is a potential amount of customers who are buying that muffin uh, when we actually, uh, sell that muffin, then probably it is there is a potential here showing uh, there is more number of people interested in this muffin, which means we need to start increasing the number of days we put that muffin uh, for sale. That's a classic example where uh, the repetitiveness of your uh, data and the patterns that you discover in data, how it can influence your machine learning. Cool. So we looked at some of the modeling patterns. From a modeling perspective, the patterns are really straightforward because uh, the algorithms pretty much take care of everything. And as long as you follow your data preparation patterns, and that is what takes more emphasis in here. So the last set of patterns, which I want to quickly walk you through is around the ML ops or machine learning operation, operationalization patterns. So what it really means so I have created the model here using my data sets, but now I have to start looking at how do I evaluate my model as well as how do I operationalize my model in terms of like, do I need to do any optimization with my models and so on. So what are the patterns available from a model evaluation perspective? So if you look at some of the design patterns under this, you have the training performance evaluation. So 
what you normally do with machine learning is you take the data sets, you split the data sets into like 70% of the data set I'm going to use for training purposes and 30% of the data set I'm going to use for uh, my testing purposes. So in the uh, training performance evaluation, how can the confidence be established in the efficiency of your machine learning model during the training time. And that's what you are actually evaluating here. So your model can make predictions and that can be randomly correct or incorrect. And how do you make sure like uh, your model uh, prediction can be quantified with the techniques that you are doing? So this is the problem statement, right? Like the solution for this particular problem is uh, you can either quantify your model by running n number of tests using the training performance evaluation. So what it really means is you can continuously run uh, your training model and use the test data to validate your training data in order to figure out like how many times you are getting the successful outcome using your test data. So in that way, you can prove the fact that how much your training model is perfect based on the outcome that you are receiving. So the next pattern you are looking under the model evaluation is your prediction performance pattern. So again, this established um, with the, in terms of confidence, but how can I make sure the, conf the confidence of my model doesn't drop when I productionize it? So rather than just looking at performance evaluation from a training perspective, how do I make sure this uh, model, if I put it in production, is not going to uh, derail anything and it is going to give me the same optimal uh, confidence that I got as part of my training. So the solution is like uh, rather than you uh, train the model with a the, the lot of data sets as I said, so sometimes what you do is 70% of your data you use for training, you periodically retrain the model and reevaluate the model based on the training data set. Then you have this 30% of the data set which is your test data set what you can do is you treat that as your production data and you have to run n number of experiments you over that model using that data in or until you get a consistent results. And that is the pattern we call it as a prediction performance evaluation. The last one design pattern under this is your base modeling. So what does base modeling mean? How can you assure that the trained model is a performant model that is going to add value for your customers to solve that particular type of machine learning problem? So normally you do that by establishing a baseline, which means to say like, okay, I have compared, run this thing across the different models. One of the thing is you can alter your values, right? So when I talked about features and things in your data, your, when you alter the features, you can get different models that you would be creating. So when you do baseline modeling, what it really means is you would have created a lot of models over the uh, different features that you have been switching and taking it off. Out of those different models, you would have got outcomes. So baseline modeling is figuring out, yes, I have considered all these aspects and this is the model that is giving me the optimal performance. And this is what I'm going to take over to production. And that's the model you are going to consider as the baseline model. Don't get frightened with all these uh, things, uh, the terminologies which I'm using here, because when you use uh, tools like automated machine learning or uh, your the visual uh, tool that you use for uh, machine learning model generation, they take care of all these things. What you are learning here, the concepts of what are the different patterns that are getting applied behind the scenes, especially when you talk about automated machine learning. So when you run experiments with the auto ML or automated ML, what you get to see is a whole heap of models. It will be ranked and also it will be telling you what is the optimized model that has been identified for your problem. How does it do it behind the scenes? These are the different approaches that it is taking or these are the design patterns that it is taking behind the scenes in order to provide you what is the optimal model that is going to be used for this problem. So what you're understanding here is like, uh, if when you are looking at the outcome of uh, automated ML or a, any model generation tools that you're using, behind the scenes, you are figuring out, okay, this is what the different data set that they are putting in front of you really mean. The last set of uh, patterns that we'll be looking under MLOps is your model optimization patterns. 
So, so the, to start with, there is a few set of patterns in this case. Like I'll start with the incremental model learning to start with, and then I will complete it. So incremental model learning, this is really important, especially in the machine learning space, because you, you create the model, it doesn't mean it is stopped. So you have to create a model in such a way, like it will automatically train itself when new data arrives. So for instance, like uh, how do you determine some features which didn't actually appear in your historical data and all of a sudden it is appearing in your new data. So these things need to be taken into consideration and you need to be uh, your data scientist or whoever is creating these models need to be alerted when these type of occurrences happen in your data. And that's what incremental model learning really means. So it's not about just putting the data and re running your models. It's all about finding out saying, have I, am I receiving any peculiar data sets which I didn't have in my historical data that I have to take into consideration and reevaluate some of the models I have got. So that's your incremental model learning. The next one is your lightweight model implementation. So how can my uh, prediction latency kept to a minimum, especially when I'm using real-time data processing so that I can provide guaranteed or acceptable accuracy? So if you want to have a use case like that, you have to apply the right lightweight model implementation pattern, which means like you take not a huge data, data set, but what you do is in real time when the data sets are coming through, what are the aspects in the data that you have to consider in order to provide an accurate prediction, but in a timely fashion, because you don't have the time, a lot of time to play with when it comes to real time data, right? So consideration that you have to keep in mind is when you have scenarios where you have to do machine learning models for real time uh, data and you have to give real time uh, outcome or predictions, then probably you need to consider this pattern, which is lightweight model implementation pattern, where you will be picking only a subset of data that you require and how quickly you can make predictions out of that data. The next pattern under this optimization technique pattern is your frequent model retraining. So how can you guarantee the efficiency of your model after its initial deployment? So the machine learning model always will be kept in sync with any changing data and also you will keep your model up to date. Similar to uh, incremental model learning, but the frequent model retraining is actually you set the interval. So sometimes like uh, you don't even need to wait until the new data is arrived. Sometimes you can just uh, retrain your model with uh, the uh, historical data itself and you can just find out whether the behavior of your uh, or the patterns that you're seeing hasn't changed yet, which shouldn't be changed in, shouldn't change in an environment. But I have seen environments where they, there is not the historical data also get touched upon. Uh, sometimes what they say is like, oh, we just updated it for some reason or we found some abnormalities. So we have to fix some data around this. So you start to notice those patterns when you uh, retrain that with the historical data. So frequent model retraining pattern really means is like you go and do this remodeling or recreation of your models or retraining of your models based on your historical data itself. So the next one is the ensemble learning. So what it really means is like, how can the accuracy of your prediction task can be increased when different prediction models provide different levels of accuracy? So as I said, when you create models with the data, you are not, especially with the different algorithms, you're not stuck with one particular model. You'll be creating, uh, you'll be creating n number of models which means like you you'll be getting into this multiple model scenario where you have to clearly uh, figure out uh, which is the model that is going to give you the optimal accuracy and performance. So how do you go about uh, doing that? Uh, normally what happens in this scenario is you create multiple models and you will combine the results of these models in such a way you sometimes get a really good accuracy. So here, you're not taking like, okay, model one 
or algorithm one gave me this answer, algorithm two gave me this answer, algorithm three gave me this answer. Sometimes combining these two algorithms, if it provides you an optimized result, that is what you call it as the ensemble learning, where you combine some of these algorithms together or the outcome of these models together in order to get an optimized model that may provide you a better outcome rather than these models having uh, providing you individually. So identifying that and if it provides it, you can go ahead and definitely do that because at the end of the day, the outcome of your model is what is really important in this case. And that's what you get out of your model optimization patterns. So in a nutshell, so what we really looked in this session is we looked at an introduction about machine learning. We then deep dive into the uh, type of algorithms that you can do within machine learning and why choosing the right algorithm is really important. So then we talked about what a design pattern actually is, which is actually finding solutions for common problems. And not only in the software world, it adds value, but also in machine learning world. Because in machine learning world, it's still uh, some of the aspects that you do like uh, data preparation, uh, data uh, cleansing and uh, model algorithm choosing for your model generation and model optimization. So these are a consistent set of uh, problems that you have irrespective of any machine learning model that you want to create. So how do you uh, apply machine learning patterns? So when you go to people and say like do cleansing or uh, find the optimized model, they won't understand what you really mean. But sometimes if you say, explain them in terms of uh, design patterns and say like, okay, this is what the design pattern I'm asking you to apply. And this is what this design pattern really mean. So if you document that in your organization, which means like any uh, person, like a developer or a data scientist, they can, they will all have a common understanding of uh, how do you apply these patterns to the machine learning problems. So that's what uh, clearly I wanted to highlight as part of this session is around how do you have this common uh, acronym or the terminology to have in your organization, especially if you are going down the path of uh, building machine learning models. With that note, I'm happy to take up uh, any questions. But before I go on doing that, first of all, special thanks to Microsoft for supporting uh, the Data Platform Virtual Summit. And thanks to all the uh, volunteers, as well as the speakers, as well as the organizers for this event. I know how hard it is to uh, organize an event like this that do nonstop uh, across the world. And I think you are covering up the entire, uh, the world's time zone here. And uh, yeah, kudos to the whole team behind this. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks, Anu.